so someone who has say hormonal acne yeah and they like because i've had a few people come to me in the past so, you know like what do you do for hormonal acne because i know that people cut out dairy cut yes. out gluten and yeah. they said it hasn't worked yeah but also like I know cleaning up your diet can help, but I was like, where would you start with that? Like, if you had like cellulite, because I know that affects eighty percent of women. Yeah. But a lot of people say like, if you lose weight, it can help go away. But mm. you often find it's still there. Is there a way to help with that? Um, that for uh, what's interesting with with cellulite, there's a level of so your fat cells are actually getting pushed through like a netting, like a matrix, right? So that's what actually what's creating that like pitted look. Okay. And there's different levels of cellulite too. So how do we know if our gut is inflamed? And or if we're suffering from leaky gut. Okay, that's a good question. So, hey guys, today I will be joined by Dee in this video. I'm so excited. So, just a little background on her. Now, I actually met Dee at an Empower You speaking event where she speaks on nutrition and health. And I saw her speak there, and I just absolutely loved and just resonated with all the content that she was sharing. And I just wanted to have her on my channel to share some awesome holistic and natural health tips with you guys. Now, Dee's a huge believer in reaching your own full potential. For almost 10 years, she's used nutrition, training, and lifestyle changes to help people up-level their health and mindset. She's also a qualified nutritionist and personal trainer. And she studied for three years of a double degree in psych and business at uni. And she's now, too, a motivational and mindset speaker for teens and young adults through the Australian Empower You program, which is where I met her work like I talked about before that's where I saw her speak at one of their events she's traveled the world being exposed to the wellness and beauty trends of many countries through her adventures of being a three-time national beauty pageant winner and has since continued to study nutrition exercise and mindset and how the three interrelate She's combined her knowledge into a super easy to understand online course which you can find through her website soultosoul.com.au and I'll link that in the description below if you guys want to check her out. I'll also link her Instagram and her YouTube channel down in the description below. She's only recently started up her YouTube channel and she has some awesome videos in there which I highly recommend. So if you do want to check them out, I rate them so high, they're really good. And last but not least, she is now a mother, which is her favorite title of all. So I can't wait to share my interview with you all with Dee. I had so much fun. It was honestly such an amazing experience. I learned a lot and I hope you guys do too. So without further ado, let's get straight into the interview. Ooh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <Straight idea. laughs> so my first question is, why is it recommended that we cut gluten and dairy out of our mm. diet? So what do they do with the body, like in the body? So both gluten and dairy for like kind of, they have different processes, different pathways in the body that they affect, mm. but both of them are like really inflammatory. Yeah. And so chronic is kind of a new word in terms of like, you know, diseases and, and issues going on with people at the moment. And basically what chronic means is that inflammation as a process, which needs to happen has happened but then it hasn't been resolved okay. so there's kind of like two sides to inflammation you get inflamed and then your body resolves that inflammation but with chronic diseases there's an underlying continuation of just the inflammatory side of things yeah. we know this is the inflammation response mm. um, but really all it means is that your body stays inflammatory and doesn't resolve so then you get like tissue damage and like things and cells and organs and tissues continue to kind of get damaged and deteriorate and like adapt, like maladapt, mm -hmm. so like in a negative way. Um, and dairy and gluten, especially because they're food, with food, it's like you're having it so frequently that it can make such a big impact which people don't really, I guess, realize. Yeah, realize mm -hmm. and then like respect the power of food. Yeah. So if you're having it in your diet, you know, as something that you have normally, mm -hmm. chances are you're gonna have it at least a few times a week. Like if you think about the amount of weeks that you're living over a period of time, like you're adding a lot to the, your inflammatory burden overall. So it like builds up over time. Totally. Oh. And the thing with dairy that's like sort of specific to dairy is that there's a few different like proteins like, you know, casein and like uh, that kind of stuff that can create, um, can sort of trigger like IGF-1, which is a growth hormone in your body. And so when you think of growths, that can be related to like you know kind of like cancerous like oh, growth yeah. or like estrogen growths or like fibroids endometriosis things that create inflammation and create growths so like um, dairy has been linked to stuff like that and stuff like acne also dairy for a lot of people is hard to tolerate because there's a school of thought about lactose which is the sugar in milk which we 
as human beings as we grow up and don't need our mum's breast milk anymore. Mm -hmm. Like technically we shouldn't need the enzyme that breaks that down. Oh, so it fades away? Yeah, it does, it does. Oh, wow. You can build a tolerance back up to it by like starting to introduce dairy, but because it's so inflammatory and because you're also receiving the hormones from a cow or a goat or whatever it is, that's also, those hormones are then also interacting with your hormones. So that's another reason why dairy is kind of an issue. So there's a whole, there's like all these layers. Because I've heard some people say like raw dairy, you know, like the untouched, unpasteurized. Yeah. What do you think of that? Look, I don't, I don't know. Uh, like if it's less processed, I guess it's better um, because it's just because it's less processed. So it's more nutrient dense, more like how nature had it intended. <laughs> um, so I, I get that school of thought, but you know, that also has a lot of bacteria in it as well. So you've got to be really cautious of that. Mm. And that's why it's usually homogenized, pasteurized and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But then by the time it gets to us in the grocery store, it's no good for us anyway. It's, it's basically, yeah, it. it's like just kind of like sugar, very little nutrients left in it, hormones from the cows, which we know like, you know, animals get pumped with hormones and we know animals are having antibiotics all the time. And if those animals are commercial animals, so it's like coals and woolies that you're getting your milk from, then those commercial animals generally don't live that great lives. Yeah. And so you can imagine like anything that that animal produces is not going to be of a good quality. Mm. So again, if you're assimilating that poor quality into your body, it makes your body less healthy and you know your quality of life decreases because you're putting poor quality foods and beverages into you. That's true. And then with gluten, <laughs> there's one thing I'll say about gluten. With gluten, there's a lot of studies that have been done on um, how gluten increases the leakiness of guts. Oh, I've heard that, yeah. And, and it's, it's across the board, even for people who don't have gluten sensitivity, Gluten has kind of like the, the largest effect or the largest influence on making people's guts leaky and it makes people's um, guts leaky across the board, like even if you don't react. So yeah, why exactly. is that? Look, I don't know. Like, is it the inflammatory response? Is that what's causing it? It is, it is, but there's, but uh, I can't remember exactly where I saw it, but I remember seeing something about gluten being similar to a different kind of chemical as well oh. which also like and this is just one aspect of like crops oh, okay. you know and grains mm -hmm. um gluten being like an issue but but when it comes to specifically gluten yeah it just seems to like it seems to make the intestines more permeable and for people who can't recover well or don't have good recoverability which is again like that kind of resolution sort of phase i was talking about before that's your body's ability to recover if your body's not good at that anyways oh. And having gluten is just going to kind of exacerbate and keep triggering an inflammatory response. Oh, I see. And like most people aren't good at recovering. And most people aren't good at that resolution phase. And most people are walking around chronically inflamed as it is. Mm. And so that's why it's more of an issue now than like for our parents and our parents' parents. Because like my dad says to me all the time, like, oh, I had that in my day and I'm fine. Dad. Yeah. And you're like, no, we can do it now. I've got a different life. I also heard that like it's because our crops have more gluten in them, in them than they did back in the ancient days because they said we genetically modified dwarf wheat to be more yeah. resistant, but now it's become higher in gluten, whereas things yeah. like um, back to like ancient grains um, and things like that, I can't think of the grains in my head right now, yeah. but and, like, they don't have as high a gluten like ratio because we haven't dabbled with them as much yeah yeah i mean that would make perfect sense i mean we've done a lot of bad stuff we genetically <laughs> modified yeah. crops and stuff like that so yeah. interesting do you yeah. have any other foods that you'd say also cause inflammation like not just dairy and gluten sugar sugar is another one yeah yeah and sugar for like so many reasons but it, it has a direct correlation with insulin so like the more sugary well, processed foods also could be a separate category mm -hmm. as well. But the more processed something is, the less nutrients it has and the more or the faster it becomes energy in our body. Okay. Now, sometimes we need fast energy, like Gatorades or those gels when yeah. people are running marathons. They need fast energy. But the average person doesn't need fast energy. You know, we're, we're not under that amount of intense demand that we need that kind of fast energy. But processed foods and sugary foods are that kind of fast energy like too fast for us to be able to burn it off or to use that energy that it's giving us and so therefore it becomes stored in um, you know fat cells mm. 
where it shouldn't be, mm. but also it will get stored in muscle cells where it should go. Okay. But because there's so much sugar at one time, and it's so fast to become, you know, to, to sort of break down in our body and need to be put somewhere, because that's insulin's role yeah. to put the sugar into, like, out of the blood, because it's sort of dangerous to be in the blood, it means that insulin gets really high, and insulin is inflammatory. Oh. So then that kind of perpetuates the whole inflammatory response. So insulin actually inflames the body to be, like, when it delivers sugar. Why yeah. would it do So that? because it has, a, a, a again, a relationship with, like, different growth factors in the body, it, it will, you know... Hormones are communicators, so hormones will tell the rest of the body, okay, we need to do this to accommodate for whatever's happening. Yeah. And so the decisions you make with what you put in your mouth is going to determine what that communication looks like down the line. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. Oh, like a welcome <laughs> I learn this stuff so much it's so, so that I can have a really generalized, <laughs> basic, easy view. But yeah. it's, it's like I think that's the hardest bit is to like learn it and then to like interpret it in like an easy, yes. easy to understand yeah. way. A hundred percent. Because it can be some things can be really complicated and you're like, wow, how do I wrap my head around yeah. it? <laughs> is it true that sugar is more addictive than cocaine? And and what happens if we consume too much of it in our diet through only sweet foods? Not through only just sweet foods, but through carbs as well. Because I heard yeah. carbs get broken down to glucose, which yes. is the sugar. Yeah. And so I was, that was going to lead me on to. Is it because with keto that's more high fat and they were mm -hmm. saying having too many carbs can be quite inflammatory? Yeah. And again, it depends on um, if you're looking at the average person these days, the average person has all of these processed foods available to them. Mm -hmm. And healthy food's a bit boring because they've got all these cool new foods that they get to try, you know, mm -hmm. which researchers and scientists have sat there per company, per product to figure out what's the way that they can make it the tastiest oh, to make you buy more. You know, it's all about taste when it comes to what you're buying in the supermarket, unless it's real food. Um, you know, we sort of touched on why sugar is not so great, mm. um, you know, because it perpetuates an inflammatory response. It's fast. It's, it's kind of like, it's just excessive. We don't need that level of sugar. Yeah. Um, and the way that nature packages things is it'll have sugar and it'll have fiber and it'll have the nutrients as well that we need to sort of transport the sugar around. Whereas when you're taking all of the nutrients out and you're just kind of putting just carbs or just sugar in, yeah. or mostly carbs and mostly sugar in, your body can't, it, it needs all of those other three macronutrients, proteins, um, fats, and carbohydrates to work together. It also needs the other micronutrients in there that we would normally get, the vitamins, the minerals, and the other plant chemicals or phytochemicals, which we're not getting because we're just taking one aspect, pulling that out, mm. and then just making it really like tasty for people. It's like people just shop for taste these days. That's so true. Which is why things are so pumped with sugar. And as well, the more sugar we have, the more sugar we crave. Mm. As it's like, you know, to do with the insulin spike. Um, because, you know, the more sugar you have, the more insulin you have to have to push that sugar out of the blood. Mm -hmm. Where it should be going is the muscle cells. But where it often goes is the muscle cells and fat cells. So it's stored in the body. It gets stored in the body. Um, and, you know, that's a clever response from our body. It's saying, well, I've got extra. If I go through a famine, I better put it somewhere in case I need it. That's smart. Yeah. yeah, it's just a survival mechanism. But we kind of, we've pushed it too far. And so that's where it's become a problem. Mm -hmm. And because our taste changes, we become really desensitized to sugar. So we just need bucket loads more sugar to even have something taste sweet. Oh. That's why, like... You know, it actually takes, I think the turnover of your, of your tongue cells and your taste buds is like, I think it's like two weeks to 30 days. Oh, to like completely like reset them. Yeah, again. to like, oh. to, to sort of start again almost. Oh, really? So yeah, so it's like if you're continuously always eating really sugary foods, mm. you're never going to get to that point where you eat a piece of fruit and you're like, oh, that's satisfying enough. That's sweet enough. You know? You're just like, I need another thing, another thing. Totally. <laughs> and this is why like if you, if you persist long enough, healthy foods become so much more tasty so if you like get past the 30 day mark and you just really reduce would you have to cut out fruit as well like really sweet fruit it depends for some people who have like real issues with insulin sometimes it's helpful to do that just to get there faster okay. but if you're doing it in a sustainable but sustainable way there's nothing wrong with fruit fruit is amazing okay and very good for you um but yeah it is higher in sugar but if you really wanted to go like all out and go extreme to just get yourself to the point where 
you, you, you know, especially like for the insulin resistance or type mm. two diabetics and stuff like that, um, or people with pre-diabetes to just really get you over the line faster. It's easier to cut out fruit for a period of time or just have less. Oh, interesting. There was a part, another part to your question. I oh, I was like, answer. um, so is it true that sugar is more deep than cocaine? Okay. So that to that part of the question, um, there have been studies in rats, um, oh. where, um, rats will like they've uh, this is just like a rudimentary uh, recollection of, of the studies but i distinctly remember reading about a study that was like they had rats had two levers mm -hmm. they had sugar and they had cocaine and they were pressing the sugar more and more and more which is crazy like you would think cocaine would be more addictive, more addictive. but the thing the interesting thing as well with um sugar is again you're building up a tolerance to it and it's accessible and it's in everything and it's not regulated. Oh. So in my opinion, it's more addictive because cocaine, you can't really get it that easily, right? Mm. Um, it's much more expensive. Um, so, you know, sugar, you can get a dollar, you can get a bunch of lollies. You know that's what I mean? True. So it's like it's in everything we eat now. Everything. So I guess it, that's why it's so addictive because they're pumping our brain with it. Yeah, exactly. And I was, I was watching um, a TED talk about a sugar scientist who is saying that 70% of the average grocery store has added sugars, like just added sugars, not real sugars, added sugars, and it's foods that aren't even sweet. Really? Like they're just savory foods, like breads or like... Really? Yeah. 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 That's to make it addictive, is it? Yeah. And like you think about it, anything you buy in a supermarket, it's a business selling their product. They want it to be the best that it can possibly be. They want you to be a return customer. Mm. They want it to be tasty. Because taste will make you choose their product over another. That's so true. You know, until like the recent kind of health evolution where people are like, you know what, I don't care if that tastes better, that's better for my health. Mm. We we're only dealing with that now because we realize just how bad we've been in the past, yeah. you know. With all these health problems popping up now. Is that like one of the causes of diabetes and obesity at the moment is because like with all this sugar, our cells now becoming insulin resistant and totally. desensitized? Yeah, 100%. From all this sugar and food. also PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Oh, is that from? Sugar? That, yeah, that's driven by an insulin, um, an insulin desensitization. Oh, wow. Yeah, where your muscles become insulin resistant. So, like, your your um, you've just basically got so many either carbs or sugars um, that you've gotten to that point where your insulin's so out of whack, and it doesn't. You, the interesting thing is that your you could get a blood tests and your insulin is not even that high, but it's the insulin and then its relation to the testosterone, which then creates PCOS, oh. and then and then once you get PCOS diagnosis, it's just like a it's just a slippery slope after that. Oh really? Because then you know then you might think that you're estrogen dominant, but then on a blood test you don't look estrogen dominant. It's not there's not a lot of estrogen in your blood, but you could be gaining weight and then you know really? uh, it's like a whole yeah. So it really just cascades your hormones out of balance. It does. Oh. Because it, it like has a knock on effect. Like one hormone has a knock on effect with another hormone, with another hormone, with another hormone. Insulin's a hormone, testosterone, estrogen, progesterone, they're all hormones. Oh, I see. So how do we know if our gut is inflamed and or if we're suffering from leaky gut? Okay, that's a good question. So leaky gut and leaky brain are the same thing. Leaky Be brain? Yeah, leaky brain. So that's why mental or like brain function issues can be symptoms of leaky gut. Oh wow. Um, so to start with, like symptoms of leaky gut, which is also leaky brain, can be like mental fog, trouble focusing, um, issues with energy, um, issues with like neurochemicals as well. So like you might be, um, you know, feeling depressed or anxious, which are, you know, those are largely regulated by brain chemicals. Um, but obviously the brain and the gut have such a strong connection. So there's that, you know, there, there could be those things like you could be experienced kind of like when things are unexplained, but you're still having these notable symptoms that a lot of the time can be leaky gut. If you're stressed, uh, that's usually an indication that leaky gut is much, you know, you're much more likely to develop leaky gut. Oh, wow. Um, hormonal issues can be leaky gut. Skin issues is a huge one. Oh, so like acne and psoriasis. Acne, psoriasis, um, eczema is a huge oh, one. Really? Eczema is a really, that's a real telltale sign. But things like even like migraines, fatigue. I mean, any, any autoimmune conditions as well. Wow. So if you have, I mean, look, 
eczema is kind of an autoimmune condition, um, psoriasis is, but like even things like Hashimoto's, Graves' disease, um, those kind of things where your body creates antibodies to things that it shouldn't be oh, wow. creating antibodies to, those are also autoimmune conditions, and autoimmune conditions are a symptom of leaky gut. Because oh. you can, once you heal the leaky gut, you can stop all those symptoms from occurring. Ah, oh, so you have to go to the root cause, right? Totally. To test it, like, totally. Try to treat all these different yeah. symptoms from it. Because the Gosh. problem with leaky gut is that, um, is what you're doing is you're, you're creating like the bag. Let's say that this small <laughs> intestine is like a bag. It's not because it's like a really long tube. But let's, let's just say, say it's, it's like a bag. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's say it's like a bag. When you have holes in that bag, anything that's inside there is going to then leak out into the blood. So that's bacteria, like bad bacteria, um, environmental toxins, and then food molecules that are too big and shouldn't be um, absorbed yet. So like you're, instead of like breaking down all your food and then getting just the nutrients from that food, mm. and the nutrients are the things that go into the blood, because you know how you can get like... Te uh, like blood tests of like what's my vitamin D, what's yeah. my vitamin B12, blah blah. That's when the nutrients seep out into the blood. But what you're getting is entire food molecules seeping out into the blood. Oh, like undigested. Exactly, mm. and that is how, like, you know, in my clinic, that's how I can tell that people have had leaky gut before or do have leaky gut because I can do a food sensitivity test with their measuring um, their immune systems IgGs so it's an it's an immune cell okay um, but I can see is there a footprint of food having entered the blood before and therefore the body has mounted an immune response to that wow. which I can test by just doing like I'll just do a blood sample for people yeah. and then I can see does this person's blood have, have has their immune system or their immune cells developed a, a response, an attack, looking for this particular food. And that's the way I can tell, oh, okay, well, if it's if it's looking for egg, egg must have been in the blood before, therefore they must have had leaky gut. So once you've got like antibodies for these foods, does that mean if you do heal, heal the heal, leaky gut, does it, will that go away? Eventually. Oh, okay, it just takes time. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah. That's crazy. I know, isn't that cool? Oh, yeah. Does not mean that you can find that through the blood test? Yeah, you can. Even if they've healed it, like yeah. you can see from before. And there are other tests you can get, like things like zonulin will tell you if you currently have leaky gut, um, which is not what you get on a, like a food sensitivity test necessarily, unless you ask for zonulin. But oh, zonulin yeah. is, and don't ask me how, I think it's something to do with when the tight junctions of the small intestine actually separate. I think that they might kind of leach off these like little zonulin oh, okay yeah like zonulin um, and then if your zonulin levels are high that can indicate that the cells are leaky and there's lots oh, of holes oh, that's interesting. between the cells yeah oh kind of curious to see the body have leaky gut. yeah <laughs> yeah so how do we heal the gut and reduce inflammation it's like what's inflammation yeah. inflammation yes like what foods would you recommend consuming for that yeah so to just to just to, the steps sort of before that question i think is when you have leaky gut it can create inflammation in your body because mm -hmm. you get immune cells again kind of like malfunctioning not that they're malfunctioning but they're just responding to something they don't need to respond to like your body shouldn't need to respond to food chemicals yeah. you shouldn't have an antibody response to food to foods yeah because that should that process should be contained in that bag there should be nothing getting out into the blood before it's ready to mm -hmm. um, so that's what's leading to inflammation the IgG, um, the cells, the immune cells in the food, they kind of create this like disastrous little chemical <laughs> that when it gets around into the body through the blood, it then can create inflammation wherever it kind of lands. Oh, really? Yeah. Is it like an endotoxin thing? Kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah like that. Um, oh, well, I, I guess it's, yeah, I mean, it becomes an endotoxin, <laughs> I guess, because like endogenous means like it's from us. Um, but yeah, it kind of creates this like toxic compound that then if say that gets say that has a, an affinity for our shoulder and then we get shoulder joint pain or something like that okay. yeah um so that that's how the inflammation is created because then our body has this response has something that it's trying to fight mm. that it doesn't necessarily need to be it shouldn't really be doing that oh. so how we heal leaky gut and it has to always really be like a really kind of targeted approach is um there's a few things so you need to basically just up the nutrients that your body needs okay to 
glue up the holes. And a really important one, uh, a really important nutrient, which is an amino acid, is glutamine. And the way that I always remembered it was like glue the holes, glue to me. Oh, that's so clever. Yeah. <laughs> Which we use up, like we use up a lot of glue to me um, when we exercise, when we walk, or, you know, as we're moving, as we're mo using our muscles, we use up a lot of glue to me. Okay. Um, but it's, it also helps to line our stomach and create that, like, you know, that lining of the stomach and um, help to plug those holes up. Wow. So, so glue to me is an important one. Zinc is really important okay. because it's very important for the, like, kind of uh, regulating the immune system response. Um, vitamin A is really important. But then also, like, there's that, and then there's also eating prebiotic foods to help the gut cells stay healthy enough to keep, to stay tight. Um, because you've also then got this, like, mucus layer, like, inside the bag, you've got, like, another bag which is like a mucus layer oh, wow. and when that mucus layer is really like intact it's kind of like your your like your sort of first defense against um breaking the wall open oh. so like your body has to sort of degrade the mucus layer to then get to the cells to then break those cells apart but if your body has is ha like has really high levels of prebiotics which are like, you know, um, starchy foods and all that, all that sort of stuff, good level of prebiotics, then you're feeding those gut cells and the gut cells are able to make this really strong mucus barrier to protect your cells from becoming leaky. Mm -hmm. So prebiotic would be more important than probiotic foods and things like At that? At first, definitely, oh, yeah. Because okay. like you could have all the probiotics that you want. If you've still got leaky gut, it's not fixing the problem. Okay. You're just adding to a pool of um, swimmers in the bag, you know, <laughs> like you're just adding more swimmers in, in the little pool or, uh, you know, <laughs> I always try these metaphors. <laughs> I think it's going well. Yeah, it? yeah, <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, so like, I mean, yeah, if you imagine it like a pool, so like the, the water is like the lumen, which is like inside, it's like the, just the sticky substances with all the stuff. Yeah. Um, and then you have like a bunch of swimmers. The swimmers, so the people in the pool, are all like the, the bacteria. And so when you're having probiotics, you're trying to populate your gut with like better swimmers, stronger mm. swimmers, and they, they sort of like knock out the weak swimmers or the bad swimmers that yeah. are creating pollution in the pool, um, which is your bad bacteria. <laughs> um, however, if you've still got the holes in the, in the bag or the holes in the pool, so <laughs> now I go with switching metaphors, um, then you're still gonna be leaking water out of the pool which is then going to be detrimental. Okay. So, you know, you've still, you've, you've got to, I think in terms of what's the first, um, you know, part of the protocol, you definitely have to glue that up first. Make sure that you're protecting the blood from all these kind of toxic, junky, yeah. dirty, you know, substances that are going to just create inflammation, chronic inflammation. Mm. And then, then look at, you know, changing the, the levels of good bacteria, bad bacteria. So it's more like the last stage. Yeah, it is. It is. Well, you have, like, is there any other foods other than bone broth for like glutamine and things like that? Yeah, all all animal meats are okay. really high in glutamine. Yeah. So like, if you say vegan or vegetarian, would yeah. there be other things that you could have, or is it yeah. more supplementing? Yeah. Um, there are very few foods that do have them. I can't think of them off the top of my head. I. I don't know about beans and things like that and lentils and legumes. I think that they may have just really low levels of glutamine in them. Um, but yeah, that's why that's why it's tough when it comes to that sort of stuff because it's either like just take the amino acid itself as a supplement, usually is what I just generally give um, vegan clients. Okay. Um, yeah, otherwise it's a matter of um, upping your, like, you know, animal meat so just making sure that they're good quality they're you know well looked after and all that sort of stuff okay yeah. so for like you, you like vegetarian vegan you'd supplement if you could yeah and then you just have the bone broth and things if you dietary exactly. requirements permitted do you have bone broth regularly and things like I, that i i will definitely go through phases where i have bone broth like almost every week okay i'll buy it at my markets and then i'll just have that as as my weekly oh, that's so good thing. and i think it's like good because it's like you're not wasting you know, you're you're really utilizing all like you know everything that you possibly can. Like nothing mm. goes to waste. It's I don't know. I just feel like it's in my mind. It's kind of between like you know as a meat eater. It's kind of between um, you know. No, I don't choose to like eat vegan. I, I try. I try. But for my health, it was really it's difficult. Hard. Yeah, and I wanted to fall pregnant. That was like you know the thing that I wanted more than anything in the world. 
and I found that that really helped me. Um, like yeah, eating meats again and, and and not having that restriction as well for me mentally that was hard too. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, I I do like I really enjoy like having the bone broth and I feel like it makes me. Um, I'm not a part of like you know wasting away that like you know beautiful animal that's that gave us that true. and i appreciate that you know you so. change how you look at it i think and you're yeah. right it's so important that we like don't waste it yeah. so they say like have like the other parts of the animal like the awful and all that stuff yeah yeah yeah, so yeah. and like you know organ mm. organ meats and stuff like that which are just like insanely high in nutrients too i know we, people just go eat <laughs> yeah like, oh, it's a bit of a waste though isn't yeah. it yeah so how are the gut and brain connected like how does our diet impact our mental health so in many ways, when you look at it in like a leaky gut situation, you're going to interrupt the neurochemicals, the hormones that are being created because you've got so much inflammation. Um, so things aren't going to get created when the system's not running smoothly. So again, things maladapt, things change, things shift, and you're not getting the, the required amount of like neurotransmitters, which are just brain hormones mm. that you would normally get if you've got stuff like leaky gut going on. The interesting thing about if you do, if you don't have leaky gut going on, when it comes to your gut bacteria, there are gut bacteria that can like bad ones that can completely block the conversion from some brain chemicals to other brain chemicals. Mm. So, like for example, um, C diff, which is Clostridia um, difficile, um, which is really high. They found in kids with autism. Oh wow! So fascinating. Crazy. change the brain chemicals in their brain to stop them they, they kind of get a dopamine overload oh. um, and they can't convert their dopamine to adrenaline so the dopamine builds up and they, they have trouble creating their own adrenaline because C. diff blocks that conversion because wow. it creates these enzymes that are like toxic enzymes and that blocks the conversion and then that's why you know autistic kids can be really hyperactive because when we're doing like you think like adrenaline activities you're like it's fast or it's scary or it's like big it's yeah. epic so autistic kids are, are trying to correct that just intuitively by running or being like you know you know kind of like overactive yeah. you know they're trying to create they're trying to push that conversion from dopamine to adrenaline oh, really? um which is like so amazing so like so there's that when you're when you've got like a good amount of you know good bacteria and your gut health is really good and gut health is determined by diversity so the more diverse strains of bacteria you have the better your gut health and the um evenness of those strains is also important you don't want any one thing overgrowing you just want like you know a happy ecosystem a happy rainforest that's where true. like everyone you know has their place and everyone's kind of working with each other but there's nothing that's like really overgrown there's no one type of tree in the rainforest that like mm. there's way more of than everything else and that's you know that determines good gut health and so when you've got everything like happy like that diverse and even that's when those gut bacteria are creating what's what's called short chain fatty acids which then play a role in the production of brain chemicals oh. and improve brain function um, and they help in the breakdown and the metabolism of your foods as well so like when you see you know an apple on a plate that apple has to go through a lot of processes to be broken down properly so that you can get the potential from that apple if you have anything that's going to stop the absorption or the um, metabolism of that apple, you're not going to get everything that you need from it. So mm -hmm. gut bacteria helps to create these short chain fatty acids and help to actually, they have enzymes themselves to help break down parts of food that we can't break down as well. Oh, so we've got a little, little teammate relationship with our cool. gut bacteria. So we give it resistant starches mostly and like other prebiotic fibers. And they give us short chain fatty acids, which help in the production of serotonin, dopamine, wow. you know, All the brain chemicals. Exactly. So, what are some like examples of short chain fatty acids? Is that, is that like omega three fatty acids? No, or is it's that different. It's like um, it's like butyrate, acetate, propionate. Like oh, I have heard of them. Yeah, before, yes. yeah. Oh, so okay. those are like the short chain fatty acids. Um, and you know, like butyrate is like probably the most studied and the most um, like glorified, and it's the one that really seems to make the biggest difference for us. Oh, really? And the interesting thing is that people can have like all different levels of, you know, like different strains, even different even strains that people have like really not heard much heard much about or researched much on. Um, however, 
their unique profile still allows them to create a lot of butyrate and still allows them to be healthy. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, gut health, you know, it's, it's important that we have lots of different ones and it's important that they're all even. But the interesting thing is that, you know, people from different parts of the world will all have like a different ideal microbiome. It's so true. Yeah. Because of the diet they eat. Yeah. Things. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. Um, they said that with like, well, no one diet fits all because everyone has such a different microbiome. So it's like, totally. if someone had vegan, maybe someone else wouldn't go well with vegan, but yeah. they'd go well with like vegetarian or yes. pescatarian or yes. something like that. It's crazy. Yes. Mm. I was going to say, is there any foods that have short chain fatty acids in them that you could like, um, or is there any bacteria that produces them? Yeah, it's bacteria that produces oh, them. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you need, you need, you need bacteria. <laughs> prebiotic foods, yeah. So just so prebiotic foods is anything that feeds bacteria. I had green bananas are like very high resistant yeah. starch. Yeah. Which yeah. is like resistant starch the more resistant starch we have, it's almost like having a carbohydrate without having all of the calories or all of the carbohydrates from that food. Okay. When things are processed, the resistant starch breaks down. I'll see it less and less and less. That's right. Mm -hmm. So that's why you want to have things in their most natural state so that you have the biggest potential to be able to feed your gut microbiome because again it's like a tag team mm. they're helping you you're feeding it it's feeding you you know to help you create what you need to, to create so they love resistant starch okay yeah uh, is it like um asparagus i've heard like jerusalem artichokes yeah yeah they, like resistance yeah starch. they do yeah so it's like quite a few foods mainly like vegetables there are or something. yeah yeah it's um yeah vegetables it depends on it depends on what it is like um even like rice has high resistant starch um the actually an interesting thing with that is like you can actually get more resistant starch from foods if you cook it and then you let it cool really so foods that are already starchy like potatoes as well um if you cook it and let it cool it'll actually increase the resistant starch over time oh like let it go completely cold yes oh wow. you can even put it in the fridge and like cool it down on purpose and it increases the resistant starch so which is cool. even better for your gut health yeah. well, no, like, you probably get used to the cold taste after a while yeah, like, yeah. Oh, it's my resistant starch I'm yeah like, it's so like, I'll do it for starch. <laughs> oh, that's such a cool tip. I like that. You're welcome. Gotta keep that in mind. What are some foods and supplements that can help with hormone imbalances? Um, so, that's a loaded question because there are so many reasons why people have hormone, hormonal imbalances in the first mm. place. So it kind of depends what the root cause is. So someone who has, say, hormonal acne, yeah. and they, like, because I've had a few people come to me and they've asked, you know, like, what do you do for hormonal acne? Because I know that people cut out dairy, cut yes. out gluten, and yeah. they said it hasn't worked. Yeah. Also, like, I know cleaning up your diet can help, but I was like, where would you start with that? Like, So, like, for me, the, the basics are so important. So for people, depending on, like, someone can have a dairy-free, gluten-free diet, but it's not that nutrient-dense. Or it doesn't match, like you're saying, their microbiome or their individual profile. So someone might have... Again, vitamin D deficiency, vitamin A deficiency, you know, maybe I, I can pick up signs that their liver is not working that well. Okay. Usually when it comes to acne, liver is a huge player. Really? And also when it comes to hormonal imbalances, liver is a big player as well. Why is that? Because the liver has to digest, well, not digest, the liver has to detoxify and metabolize all of your hormones, okay. plus all of your toxins. Everything, like every food item, every toxin, everything goes through the liver. Yeah, it's such a, it, it's a huge <laughs> part because it's almost like it's the filtration system. It's like, is this okay? Yep, okay, go into the body. Is this okay? Oh, no, go over here. Is that okay? Okay, go into the body. So your liver is like really overloaded with stuff, mm. especially when it comes to like environmental toxins. We have more environmental toxins now and chemical like pesticide exposures and That's all that sort of stuff than we've ever had before mm. because of technology and genetically modified, you know, foods and all that sort of stuff. Mm. And our liver has the very hard job of having to sort through all of that, things that it's never seen before and things that, you know, that it knows what it is, but things that it's never seen before, it's kind of like, well, there's so much of this, what do I do with it? It gets overwhelmed. This is why people are putting on weight so easily because oh, really? fat, uh, fat houses toxins. It oh, will take wow. it to protect your body from it because when fat cells, like fat cells can be really nasty. Like they can basically just become little estrogen powerhouses by themselves where they're just like, yeah, they just hold on to toxins, they create all this estrogen, and then the liver has all this extra stuff to deal with, not only toxins in the body, but also extra estrogen on top of whatever your body is already producing on its own. Um, then you add something like the pill or, mm. or you know, 
could be any kind of medication that people are on or people are having a lot of bread organic like you know not eating organic and having pesticides and herbicides maybe they have heavy metal exposure you know maybe maybe they're um you know maybe they've got copper pipes at home because they're so old so maybe whenever they drink water they're having all this copper that those heavy metals are gonna gonna be detoxified by the liver so you've got like this huge burden on the liver poor liver <laughs> poor liver but I find that it's it's when the liver's not um, when the liver's not working as well as it could be, that's when I find a people get hormonal imbalances the most, and b they get acne the most. So how would you go about like helping the liver? I guess do you have to detox. Y yeah, you do. Like so, bitter foods are great for the liver. Anything that tastes bitter. What's like a, like dark chocolate or something? Um. Or yeah. Okay. Like a like true dark chocolate. Yes. Yeah. That can definitely be it. Olives. Oh. Rocket, oh, you know yeah. there's like not nice. Food. You know those yeah. You know there's like shitty like red like leaves and salads. Everyone's like ooh, I hate this stuff. <laughs> With that, those those are really helpful. Um, and there's also this whole there's also a whole um, category of herbs called cholagogs, oh, which yeah. are bitter and help to stimulate the liver. So anything that's anything that's bitter is going to help the liver create more bile to help the body break down fats really well um, because essentially it, it then comes down to your body's not breaking down fats that well and then it comes back to omega-3 fatty acids like you can have all the good fats in the world that you want but if your body's not breaking it down the barrier like the acid mantle of your skin then gets affected oh so you get acne exactly oh, wow. so, and then it's like it gets it's so easy to get irritated and sensitive because you you don't have that omega-3 fatty acid layer over your skin you know which is stopping things from entering in and stopping water from leaching out so then it's like your skin becomes more dehydrated and it has all these toxins that it's getting irritated really easily so it's like this whole you know cycle. it's a whole cycle mm -hmm. and that's just like we're just talking really about hormonal acne like you can see there's so many other things wow so for hormones it's really about addressing the whole person rather than spot reducing things but it depends on exactly what the hormonal condition, condition so is. if you did have hormonal acne a good place to start would be maybe like looking at the liver yes mm -hmm. and like dandelion tea is amazing oh, for liver this is some, yeah yeah this is something i really i, I that's probably my go-to for people when they want to start helping their liver it's the most gentle it's just a tea it's really cheap it's really easy to, to do um mm. easy to you know incorporate into your diet um and it's you know even though it doesn't taste the best, you know, you can kind of make it taste better, I guess, with like honey or whatever. Mm. Not that I encourage that. <laughs> I want it to be really bitter tasting, but people can usually hack a drink that tastes bad as opposed to like having to eat foods that they don't like that's that so are bitter. True. Yeah. You're like, oh, it's just down it. And then exactly. Down. Exactly. They're like, oh, good. That's done. Out, mm. out of my way. And so they can enjoy their food, their that's meal. That's true. So that's definitely a place I'd start. Okay. Yeah. Um, and with the fat storing toxins and things, does that mean if you were to start losing weight, you will exacerbate all these symptoms on your face and yes. body and things like yes, that? Yes, yes. So as you sh start to shed weight, and this is not really well known, right? Um, this is what always worries me about, like, you know, and right here, like, the biggest loser. Or people, okay. like, you know, people get sick. And this is, this is what I think the keto flu is tied into so as people start to move to, to a keto diet they start to get really sick and i think it's because when their body starts to adapt to using fat as a fuel source they start to burn fat mm. and then the toxins from their fat start to get liberated into the body yeah if your detoxification systems are not open and helping you drain all that stuff out then you get this overload of toxins at one time oh, wow. because your body is finally releasing them and like uh, like opening the floodgates mm. like letting it circulate so is that That's a great question? Oh, thank yeah. you. I just was wondering, is that a good thing to let it out because now it's circulating through the body? Only if you have the capacity to deal with that. So if you didn't, it would just make you sicker. Yeah. Oh, and then you have to adjust the whole detoxifying. Yeah. So like, if it's if it's within the range of it's your body is able to to detoxify it, then it's okay. You won't notice the symptoms as much. Like you might you might be like, oh, I got a bit of an itchy nose or a bit of a sore throat, but it's nothing that eventuates, okay. you know, to like feeling really horrible. But then, say for example, for example, something like the keto flu, you might be knocked out for three days with full-on flu-like symptoms because your body is trying to flush out this high load of toxins which have come from you. 
you know? It's like, where does it come from? Does exactly, come from? yeah, from you. Oh, so will that happen the whole time you're starting to burn all this fat, or is it like a week and then it will start to settle down? It depends, bit? again, on your body's ability to um, deal with that level oh, of toxin okay. exposure. Gosh. Yeah. Oh, well, if I was to shed fat, I hope I'd be able to, like... Yeah, yeah, it. totally, totally. Oh, yeah. Well, that's why if you do it in a sustainable way, you don't normally get those effects. People who do things really drastically, oh. they will usually be the people who get those those effects. So a sustainable way would be, like, to do, it like, a half a kilo, like, maybe... Like, yeah, 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 like yeah half that. a kilo a week, yeah, yeah. So you're not just, all of a sudden, just releasing the body. Exactly. Weight, you know, and if you're doing it in a way that gives your body the nutrients that it needs in order to detoxify things properly... Again, you're going to improve and support your detoxification pathways as it is. Okay. So it's, you're going to sort of feel those that toxic burden even less. Oh, that's so good. Mm -hmm. So having the bitter foods and things like that. Like yeah, detox. And like real whole foods is going to help. Oh, we already talked about this. I was going to say, what would you would, for someone taking like harmful medication? Like what, that would be like you'd have to switch to then addressing the whole. Um, like for hormonal acne and things mm. like that, you switch to then address the liver problems and things like yes. that. Yes. So are you talking about like Roaccutane yeah. being a harmful medication? Yeah. I was on Roaccutane. You were how I was on Roaccutane when I was in year 12 and I think my first year of uni. And boy, oh boy, did that. Now when I look back, I'm like, wow, that explains the whole, my whole liver situation. What happened? So like that's really, it's a personal experience that I realized how important the liver is. But my acne went away for a little bit. My vitamin A levels must have been so toxically high that that affected my liver. Because then after that, I just had rebound acne and I could never get rid of it. And I always had that like extra bit of like weight. Like I was always strong and I was always like healthy looking. But I knew for my body, I was like, mm, I feel like I'm puffy. I feel like I'm inflamed. I don't feel quite right. I don't, I don't feel as healthy as I look. Mm. It's very easy to look healthy, you know, mm. very easy with all the products and stuff we can use. It's so easy to look healthy. That's very true. Um, you know, when you use like real products, health, like, you know, natural products. You feel different. You feel different. And, and you're showing your true level of health by doing that. That's so true. You're not covering up with like putting like tanning on you to make you look more tan. Exactly. Or, like, makeup and things exactly. Like that. Or, you know, using really like really extreme like chemicals to just make you look like you have a glow for 24 hours but really unless you had makeup on it your skin looks horrible mm. or it's patchy or it's whatever you know what i mean yeah. so and like your hair as well like you know people do so much stuff to <laughs> to their hair like i mean and their whole body really and like you know there's fat cavitation and liposuction like mm. you can look healthy this day and age for not like you know but not very much. You, know, you don't have to spend that much to look very healthy, but are you truly healthy? I don't think so. A lot of people aren't. That's actually a good point. And this is like that, that's like the kind of the balance I'm always trying to look at um, maintaining for people. It's like, yes, people have aesthetic goals. People come to me with aesthetic goals all the time. I want to look like this. I want to look like that. I want this shape here and I want smaller this or bigger that or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I have to figure out all this stuff basically that we've been talking about for this one person and go, okay, how do I get them that or as close to that without sacrificing their health? And how do I actually like improve their health to get to that point? Mm. Or at least allow them to get to a point where they know how to recover or their body has the ability to recover should they go too far. Oh, yeah. It's just really kind of finding a balance. Of then. course, yeah, it is. It's totally a balance. If you had like so you like, because I know that affects 80% of women, 80 of women yeah. but a lot of people say like, if you lose weight, it can help go away, but mm. you often find it's still there. Is there a way to help with that? Um, that for uh, what's interesting with, with cellulite, and I haven't looked, I'm not an expert on cellulite, I definitely wouldn't say, but with, but with cellulite, there's a level of, so your fat cells are actually getting pushed through like a netting, like a matrix, right? So that's what actually what's creating that like pitted look. Oh, and there's different levels of cellulite too. So for one thing, it's to do with dehydration. Oh, really? For another thing, it's skin integrity. So like things like collagen, elasticity, vitamin C, vitamin A, all of uh, zinc, all of those micronutrients that are really important for good skin health also play a role. But the lymphatic system plays a huge role. And that comes back to toxins. And then that comes back to detoxification. Oh, really? <laughs> so that's a sign of like detoxification. Yeah. Problem. And I noticed as well when I, so I used to have gorgeous skin, like, mm -hmm. you know, I'm half Lebanese, I have this beautiful olive, like glowy skin. 
it's taken me so long to get back to a point where I feel like comfortable with my skin because it's still always on the dry side even now. But it was Roaccutane that made the difference for me for the worse. Oh. And I remember when, when I came off Roaccutane and I only did it for four months. You know how you meant to do it for six, a six-month stint? Oh, I've never taken it um, so Well, yeah, um, you meant to do it for a six-month stint. Um, but I only did it for four months. And after that four-month period, I got cellulite that didn't go away for years. Really? And again, it was linked back to that whole liver detoxification. Um, and so I was able to like pinpoint the exact moment when my cellulite, cellulite began. So would you say like vitamin A, vitamin C? Yeah, and zinc. More, um, so zinc, zinc is well. a big one that um, vegans can easily become deficient in or, or have low levels in. Oh, okay. um, and zinc is very important. Um, you'd probably be getting a decent amount of vitamin C as long as you're a vegan that's a whole food vegan. Yeah. A lot of people are just eating packaged crap that Precious. looks like looks like the food they used to eat, which mm. is just not healthy at all. Mm. Um, but zinc can be a huge, like, can play a huge role in that too. But then so can you know your lymphatic system. So okay. you know, with a vegan diet, it's it's carbohydrate heavy. Mm. Carbohydrate heavy foods can change the pH of your stomach acid. Mm. Um, it can change the pH of your mouth, um, and, and it can, can change your your bacterial profile. Um, you know, obviously it has the potential to do all those things for the better, but a lot of the time because people aren't eating, their, their macronutrients are not well balanced enough, um, that then it creates all of these other problems that then down the line create these kind of end products being things like cellulite and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, it decreases, like when your pH changes and when your um, detoxification isn't as good because you kind of become a bit more inflamed from the carbohydrate heavy diet, that changes your body's ability to detoxify. It changes your body's ability to, um, you know, break down fats, which again is really important if you're looking at liver health and detoxification because lymph needs blood to circulate but it's but lymphatic tissue is carrying all your fats. Okay. Um, so you know it's it's in relation to you know fat absorption, fat breakdown, um, how well you know you move your body, how well your how good your circulation is, um, you know. So I mean, there's a lot of things at play because then like even now, what popped into my mind was thyroid function okay. too. Um, thyroid function needs a lot of zinc, it needs a lot of iodine. Again, both of those are very minimal in a vegan diet. Where would you get them from? Meats. Meat. Oh, so, mainly. Yeah. So, I mean, look, you can find zinc in other foods, like you know, your lentils and stuff yeah. like that, and some nuts and all that sort of stuff. But zinc is very high in meats, um, iodine is very high in fish. Um, and, and seafoods. Mm. Um, so I mean, even if you have seaweed, seaweed is a good source okay. of iodine. Um, but then, so you, so potentially you're lower on those. And especially if you're an active vegan, it's really hard to top up what you're using as oh, well, because then you're you're putting a lot of pressure on your thyroid for a lot of output because you're so active. Because thyroid uh, governs your metabolism. Is known to have this yeah. in it, so it's going to happen. Yeah. No, look, I think I think as a as a vegan, definitely B twelve and zinc. I think those are the two most important ones. You can tell with your nails, can't you? If you get the white on your nails, that yeah, zinc. white spots is usually related to zinc. Yeah, so zinc deficiency. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Who are your three top influencers you'd recommend following for more practical tips and info, like on holistic living and things yeah. like that? I love Dr. Mark Hyman. I think he's so great. He's awesome. I love him. For hormones, which is where like my journey began with hormones because I had PCOS myself and then I was researching a lot with hormones. I love Elisa Vitti. Okay. She shows people how to eat or shows women how to eat for their cycle to match the hormonal fluctuations in their cycle. That is so cool. And even to a level of like work productivity to match the hormones and how your brain changes during each week of your cycle. Like it's fantastic. Um, so Alyssa Vitti, who, who wrote the book Flow Living and um, The Woman Code, which is her second book, um, and Dr. Sarah Godfrey. So she's, um, she's awesome. I mean, there are plenty more. I mean, there are heaps. So but those are the three that like, I really, you know, I always kind of go back to them and I love their information. Um, Dr. Sarah Godfrey is like a real, she's a real experimenter, like okay. a real biohacker. And I love that about her. Yeah. And Cell to Soul, like my business name really came about from something that she said once. Mm -hmm. And she said, you know, from health, like health from your cells to your soul. And I was like, ah, oh, 
such a song. I know. I was like, that's brilliant. <laughs> that is so brilliant. It was just like a passing comment that she made, and I was like, that, like that, for me, sums up exactly how I understand nutrition to help the body. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to be following these people. When yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, make sure you do. They're awesome. Oh, that's so cool. I really love that idea of eating two cycles. I've never heard that before. Yeah. That's really. That cool. was like one of the first, the first things that sort of started to open up my mind about how different functional medicine is to so like just conventional mm -hmm. medicine. Oh. I was like, huh? <laughs> I like, I've been a woman for how long? And not I don't know one other girl who's ever known that this is a possibility. No. Like that it's it was so it was so groundbreaking for me. And I even I train differently according to my cycle. Oh interesting. So yeah, so you kind of have your not only are you much more social kind of mid cycle, but you also have more energy. So you can do if you're a person who likes hit, that's the better time to do hit classes. That's the better time to do intense cardio workouts. That's the better time to do heavy weights because your body can deal with that intensity. Oh, wow. Yeah, um, because you're kind of like leveraging off the increased progesterone. But then in the second half of your cycle, the week before you have your period and then the week that you have your period, your body does better off low intensity exercise and like more moderate or low intensity. You know, things that are really restorative like yoga and Pilates and maybe lighter weights or lighter aerobics. Um, like still doing what you enjoy and still getting the most out of life, but not ever feeling like you're depleting yourself in order to just tick a box to say you did this exercise. That's so true. Yeah. Oh, it's such a different way about looking at exercising as well to like exercise to your body. Because I know people say yeah. like intuitive eating, but it's like intuitive exercise. Yeah, it totally. So yeah, it is. It well, thank you so much for joining. No me worries. And for, like doing this interview. Had a great time. I'm so <laughs> grateful. Oh, no worries at all. It's been the best talk ever. <laughs> pretty much sums up my interview today i hope you guys enjoyed today's video thank you for sticking out the whole hour long interview with me i hope you enjoyed it i hope you guys learned a lot do share in the comments below your biggest tip or biggest lesson or biggest like takeaway that you found from this video i found the bit about like hormonal acne and just how detoxing plays such a big role in cellulite and the overall wellness of the body was my biggest takeaways from my interview but as i was editing it and just watching over the footage i was like oh my gosh that was such a huge takeaway oh my gosh i remember that like so many different things that I took away and every time i watch it it's like a different like lesson or take away from it so yeah such a great interview i hope you guys enjoyed it today's ginormous gigantic huge shout out goes to keep it raw thank you so much for commenting on my tooth powder diy video i'm so glad you liked it that tip about adding neem oil to tooth powder as well was a really awesome tip so i was going to keep that in mind and do that next time so thank you so much for watching and for sharing such a lovely comment being so supportive thank you everyone for your love your support your endless encouragement it means so much to me every time i look at your comments i'm just like oh, I'm so touched so thank you so much i'm so grateful for you guys and just your loving kind words and just for being such a supportive community it means so much to me i hope you guys enjoyed today's video and i hope fingers crossed to see you in my future videos but for now good night guys and i'll see you in my next video bye